couple times. Welcome. So good to see everyone tonight. Welcome to Personal Conversations, one of several educational programs for members of Women's League for Conservative Judaism. In the Personal Conversations series, we try to take a deeper look at current and personal issues of concern to Jewish women. We're delighted to have a fairly large audience from across the US and Canada, and sometimes we even have some of our sisters in Israel join us. I am Vivian Lieber, the chair of Personal Conversations series, and this is session number three during this term. Uh, before we begin, it's my pleasure to introduce Women's League International President Debbie Goldich for a few words. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Um, I would like to welcome everyone, and it's wonderful to see all of you. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, it's wonderful to see the regulars who get onto almost every program, and it's also wonderful to see new people who come on. Um, we try to provide programming for everyone, and we try to provide opportunities for learning and engagement that offer a variety of programming. Um, I would think that most of you read about tonight's program on Women's League Week, which is our weekly newsletter. Um, if you did not read it on there because you don't receive it, please let me know, put your name and your email in the chat, and we'll make sure that you receive the Women's League weekly newsletter every week and our Shabbat message. Um, I also want to thank Renee Glazer for tonight, and Renee has been a longtime leader in Women's League. Um, locally on her sisterhood, on the region level and on the international level. And we love it when one of our own um, provides a program that can combine their professional career and their vocation. So thank you, uh, Renee, for being with us tonight and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, Debbie. And now it's again, my pleasure to introduce Women's League Executive Director, Rabbi Ellen wallens -Fields. Erev Tov to everybody. As we are learning about the process of aging and aging in general, I think that it's about life. So I wanted to just begin with a prayer from a book called Jewish Prayers of Hope and Healing. And the prayer is called Life is a Symphony. The book's by Alden Salovey. God of ancient secrets, source of life, creator of beauty, divine light of sacred truth. My strength has its limits. My power, its purpose. The energy of life flowing from a secret well beyond my reach and beyond my imagination. What I find and what finds me are a mystery and a miracle. Heavenly hands of radiance and hope, author of all being, grant me the wisdom and understanding to live my life as a symphony, a river of majestic music that blesses and sustains with holiness and love, that I repay with kindness and charity. Give me the passion and the patience to hear the rhythms of your glorious creation. You God who bring beauty and song, guide me with your power. Teach me with your kindness, your chesed. Show me the reverence for your secret truths so that I live a life of joy and celebration with gratitude for your creation. Baruch atah Adonai ha-yushua v'haromamut v'shircha u'tahalacha habria. Blessed are you, God of salvation and splendor. Creation sings your praise. And let us all say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, this program will run for an hour and a quarter approximately, and it's being recorded. Karen Belena is helping us with um, the behind the scenes administration of this session. Thank you, Karen. After editing this recording, uh, the link will be shared uh, by posting it on the Women's League website for you to view again or for others to view it who've missed tonight. Usually it's on the news tab or it's on the women's, under programs, Women's League's personal conversations. I think tonight's topic is of universal interest. Our special guest, Renee Glazier, will direct a conversation that we've entitled What's Good About Aging? And subtitled, and when it's not, how can seniors and their families manage the challenges with less stress? We all experience the upside and downstairs of the senior years, either directly ourselves or through our loved ones. And eventually everyone cycles through this 
stages of aging. So I am delighted to present our guest, Renee Glazier. Renee is a certified geriatric care manager, now retired. She has long practiced in the Boston area. Then she resettled with, about eight years ago with her husband in San Antonio, Texas. Early on, she had earned an MBA degree. After taking her mother into her home and caring for her during the final few years of her life, Renee then was inspired to earn a degree in gerontology. She first served as an ombudsman for nursing homes, but in 1999, she founded and then long managed her own business, Aging Link, which provided personalized elder care services to seniors and their families. She also served as a consultant to other professionals and not-for-profit organizations that had elderly clients. Support groups that Renee facilitated, including one called Adult Children of Aging Parents. And as a public speaker, her topics have included the joy of aging, aging is not for sissies, the person in the middle, and navigating the elder services maze. Renee also has a long history with Women's League, having held numerous, as Debbie told us, numerous board and executive committee positions. She served as a region president, as the chair at various times of social action, community service, and women's health, and as a consultant to region conferences, as a trainer, and until recently, she was the editor of Women's League's publication, Outlook. Her first journey what began when she watched her mother prepared an Onyx Shabbat for her Newton, Massachusetts sisterhood. The desserts were the hook for Renee. Drawing her into that, it drew her into sisterhood. There she eventually became its president, then branch president, then region president. She attributes that pathway of building skills and success to the confidence and experience she gained during those early years of sisterhood leadership. Please note, that Renee will accept audience questions after the first part of the program, and then again after a second part of the program. So please hold your questions and place them in the chat box and we'll be monitoring that and take as many questions as time permits. So welcome Renee. We're very pleased to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. The joys of aging. Aging is gradual, rhythmic, and highly choreographed. It holds no surprises. And in the main, its course and consequences are well known. No one goes to bed at the height of vitality and wakes up old. Like water on a stone, this gradual progression is the power of aging. Our population is aging. One in eight Americans is over 65, and those over 85 are the fastest growing population segment. But no matter your chronological age, it is your emotional age that really matters. Many midlifers or baby boomers are bucking old concepts of aging and the negatives of ageism. They are realizing that it is time to create a new picture of vital aging. They view the second half of their life as an empty canvas, a blank page, a hunk of clay to be crafted. These people experience a sense of liberation that comes from discovering who they are and how best to express it. They ask, where do I belong? What do I care about? What is my purpose, my legacy? These are people who age joyously, like the woman in Jenny Joseph's poem, Warnings, who says that when she grows old, she will wear purple or will, and will also be irreverent. Did you know that many people's greatest accomplishments happened in later life? This suggests that we get better as we get older. Actor George Burns won his first Oscar at 80. Golda Meir was 71 when she became Israel's prime minister. At 96, playwright George Bernard Shaw broke his leg when he fell out of a tree that he was trimming. Painter Grandma Moses didn't start painting until she was 80. 
She completed 1,500 paintings after that. 25% were done when she was past 100. Casey Stengel retired from managing the New York Mets at 75. And Joe Biden became the president of the United States at the age of 78. Do you approach aging with joy? Do you realize that the only time we like to get old is when we're kids? When you're less than 10, you're so excited about getting older. You think in fractions. You're four and a half, never 36 and a half. Better yet, four and a half going on five. You get into your teens. Now they can't hold you back. You jump to the next number or even a few ahead. You could be 13, but you'll say, you're gonna be 16. But then the greatest day of your life, you become 21. Even the words sound ceremonious. But then you turn 30. Makes you sound like bad milk. What's wrong? What changed? You became 21, turned 30, then you're pushing 40. Whoa, put on the brakes. Before you know it, you reach 50. But wait, you make it to 60. You've built up so much speed that you hit 70. After that, it's a day-to-day -day thing. You get into your 80s and every day is a complete cycle. You hit lunch, turn 30 and reach bedtime. Sounds like the life we're leading now during COVID. And it doesn't end there. Into the 90s, you start going backwards. I was just 92. Then a strange thing happens. When you make it over 100, you adopt your kid attitude and say, I'm 100 and a half. Hats off to the healthy 100 and a half and then some. Is aging physical or attitudinal? How would you answer the following? Does everything hurt and what doesn't hurt doesn't work? Do you feel like the night before and you haven't been anywhere? Does your address book contain more names that end with an MD? Do your children begin to look middle-aged? Does your back go out more than you do? Just spend a lot of time thinking about the hereafter. You go to get something and wonder what you're hereafter. Do you know all the answers, but no one asks you the questions? Do you need glasses to find your glasses? If you answered yes to any of these questions, it doesn't mean that you're old, but rather that perhaps you have not found that joy in aging. To find that joy, let me share some observations made by political satirist Will Rogers, who said, eventually you will reach the point when you stop lying about your age and start bragging about it. Some people try to turn back their odometers, not me. I want people to know why I look this way. I traveled a long way and some of the roads weren't paved. One of the many things no one tells you about aging is that such a nice change from being young. Being young is beautiful, but being old is comfortable. One must wait until evening to see how splendid the day has been. If you don't learn to laugh at trouble, you won't have anything to laugh at when you're older. Let's debunk some aging myths. Being old doesn't mean being sick. Of the people over 75, nearly one half have arthritis, one third high blood pressure, heart disease or hearing loss, 11% diabetes. But rarely do these problems get in the way of full life. Only 5-2% live in nursing homes and nearly 90% of those 64 to 75 have no disabilities and even after 85, 40% are fully functional. Only 10% of the people, 65 to 100 plus, are Alzheimer's patients. The aged brain has a remarkable, enduring capacity to make new connections, absorb new data, and acquire new skills. Internet, email, Twitter, and Zoom. Although short-term memory may weaken with age, techniques can help. You are not doomed. It's never too late to change unhealthy habits and reap benefits. Quit smoking, exercise, eat well, lose weight. Good genes don't necessarily mean good aging. 
only 30% of the characteristics of aging are hereditary. And the role that genet genetics plays in health along with physical and mental function diminishes with age. Elders do contribute. Older people do not get enough credit for unpaid work and don't always have equal access to good paying jobs. They do the work of 3 million caregivers by caring for spouses, siblings, grandchildren, and are the cornerstone of so many charities. Research shows that there are definite benefits of aging. Less earaches, fewer murders are committed by older people, less sleep, no menstruation, less novocaine is needed at the dentist, less inhibited, and focus less on should and more on want. Since there is less, less left to learn the hard way, as we age, we get wiser. Thanks to experience, we may be better at making decisions We've already decided about school, career, family, retirement, sometimes more than once. We tend to be more expert in certain areas than we were when we were younger, and we often are happier. Things you buy now won't wear out, and we get senior discounts too. You can eat dinner at 4 p.m. at an early bird special. Your joints predict the weather better than the TV meteorologist. You're funnier and less inhibited. Your hearing, seeing, and remembering are more selective. You get Medicare, Social Security, and cash in 401ks and concentrate less on should and more on want. To age successfully, consider starting where you are. Don't worry too much about the future or spend too much time thinking about the past. Life happens in the now. Be positive. An optimistic outlook is important. Studies have shown that older people who believe in negative age stereotypes tend to fulfill them. And younger people with negative attitude towards ageism tend to have heart problems later in life. Complaining too much or being a saint can be boring. So avoid both to the extreme always have something to which to look forward. Stay connected. Don't become isolated. Family and friends are important. Stay in touch with longtime friends and find new ones of all ages. Never refuse help, but don't overdo it either. Develop spirituality. Researchers agree that inner resources, particularly our spiritual beliefs, play a crucial role in our well-being. The very act of believing can help keep us well. Belief can heal. Prayer, meditation, and ritual are anecdotes to stress and promote good health. Being part of a prayer group or attending religious services can be a means to aging with joy. Religious services can be full of potential therapeutic elements music, aesthetic surroundings, familiar rituals, prayer and contemplation. All distractions from everyday tensions, opportunities for socialization, relationship building and joyous aging. Take responsibility. You are responsible for your physical well-being. To be old does not necessarily mean you'll be sick. You are never doomed. It's never too late to change those unhealthy habits and reap the benefits. Health is your responsibility. You and your PCP are partners. Medical experts disagree about a lot of things, but they all agree that good health depends on improved access and increased use of preventative services. See your healthcare professional routinely. Uh, I have this a handout that we'll look at later. It's an RX for doctor's visits. Stay on track and focus on what really matters. Exercise regularly, walk, garden, dance, swim, get enough sleep, about seven hours. Get rid of stress, think, challenge your brain, socialize, eat right, reduce or eliminate smoking, avoid secondhand smoke. 
keep alcohol consumption to a moderate level, wear seatbelts, and during COVID, face masks. Don't fight aging. Wear hearing aids, glasses, dentures, and medical alert devices. Important checklists for screening include yearly blood pressure, cholesterol, and mammogram, pap smear, colorectal cancer screening, diabetes, thyroid, glaucoma, dental exams, flu, pneumonia, shingle shots, tetanus boosters, and the COVID vaccine, breast exams, and blood tests. Cherish your health. If it is good, preserve it. If it is unstable, improve it. If it is beyond what you can improve, get help. Give to others. Find satisfaction and joy from helping others through volunteer work, community service, and advocacy. People who volunteer live longer. Studies show that when you do good, we feel good. Volunteering improves health physically, mentally, and emotionally. From the motivation to stay well to the social connection with others, to the sense of pride from contributing to the community, volunteers get a lot for giving. When we volunteer our time to teach, mentor, participate, raise funds, serve the community, advocate for a cause or perform good deeds, it is a win-win situation. The recipient benefits and the donor feels alive, useful, joyful, and experiences improved health too. Through increased mobility, fewer falls, less stress, reduced medication, and decreased depression. We expand our social networks when we work with others for a common cause. Whatever age we are, we need to feel needed. Having purpose and meaning is life enriching. Keep growing and learning. Learn and experience new things. We're doing this today. You can always learn. The aged brain has a remarkable and enduring capacity to make new connections, absorb new data, and acquire new skills. Although short-term memory weakens with age, training techniques can help. Keep learning a new craft, garden, dance, study, use the computer, surf the net, get on Facebook, start a blog, do crossword puzzles, join a book group, read and discuss articles in newspapers, magazines. Never let the brain get idle. Use it or lose it. You are responsible for your own happiness. Be open, relax, try new experiences, embrace change. Life is full of surprises. Maintain a sense of humor. Life cannot be controlled. So roll with the punches. Make time to smell those roses. We do not stop playing because we are old. We grow old because we stop playing. The secret to staying young, being happy, and achieving success is to laugh. Find humor daily. Dream. When you lose your dreams, you die. There are many people walking around who are dead and don't even know it. There is a huge difference between growing older and growing up. Anyone can grow older. It takes no talent or ability. The idea to grow up by always finding opportunity in change. Have no regrets. Elders usually, usually do not regret what they did, but rather what they did not. It's never too late to be all you can possibly be. Remember, growing older is mandatory. Growing up is optional. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. God promises a safe landing, not a calm passage. To remain young, you need to throw out non-essential numbers like age, weight, and height. Let the doctor worry about them. That's why you pay him. Keep only cheerful friends. The grouches pull you down. Don't be a grouch either. Enjoy the simple things. Some suggestions from Ruth Jacobs, the author of Be an Outrageous Older Women are, 
put money in an expired parking meter or pay the toll for strangers. This is unorganized charity work, random acts of kindness. Put a basket of marbles outside your door to show you've not lost your marbles yet. Lunch on samples at the supermarket. Write outrageous letters to the local paper. Express your pet peeves. Wear wild clothes. Make your own statement. Use your best dishes every day. What are you saving them for anyway? Laugh often, long and loud. Laughing produces endorphins, natural relaxing agents. Laughing is a workout for your lungs, heart, and torso and relaxes tense muscles. If you have a friend who makes you laugh, spend lots and lots of time with him or her. The tears do happen. Endure, grieve, and move on. The only person who is with you your entire life is you. Live while you are alive. Surround yourself with what you love. Family, pets, keepsake, kids, music, flowers, hobbies, and friends, whatever. Be needed. Plants and pets will always need you, even when there are a few, fewer people in your life. Don't take guilt trips. Take a trip to the mall, the theater, or museum, but not to where the guilt is. Endure, grieve, and move on. The only person who was with you your entire life is oneself. Live while you're alive. It is good. If it is good, preserve it. If it's unstable, improve it. If it's beyond what you can improve, get help. Tell the people you love that you love them often. And always remember, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. Don't resist growing old. Many are denied that privilege. An older woman, an older person has the luxury of living in the moment and enjoying each day, not as a means to an end, but rather as an end in itself. We can benefit from the present, look upon accomplishments and enjoy current relationships. We can correct past transgressions, heal hurt feelings, and repair what's broken. May we have the wherewithal and the wisdom to make the most of all of life's stages. Don't count the days that have left us. Instead, make the most of each day that we have. An older woman was asked what she thought about being old. She responded, old age is a gift. I am now probably for the first time in my life, the person I always wanted to be. Oh, not my body. I sometimes despair over my body, the wrinkles, baggy eyes, protruding stomach and sagging butt. And often I'm taken aback by that older person in my mirror who looks like my mom. But I don't apologize. I don't agonize over it for long. I would never trade my amazing friends, my wonderful life and my loving family for less gray hair or a flatter belly. As I've aged, I've become kinder and less critical of myself. I'm now my own friend. I don't chide myself for eating that extra cookie or drinking another beer or not making my bed or buying that silly yard, yard ornament that I didn't need. I'm entitled to a treat, to be messy, to be extravagant. I've seen too many dear friends leave this world too soon before they understand the great feed freedom that comes with aging. I can play or read the, read the computer until 4 a.m. and sleep until noon, dance with myself to those wonderful tunes of the 50s and 60s. And if at the same time I wish to weep over a lost love, I will. I will walk the beach in a swimsuit that is stretched over a bulging body and I will dive into the waves with abandon, if I so choose. Sometimes I am forgetful, but there again, some of my life is just as well forgotten, and I eventually remember the important things. Sure, over the years, my heart has been broken by the loss of a loved one, a suffering child, 
or a pet long gone. The broken hearts are what gives us strength, understanding, and compassion. A heart never broken is pristine and sterile and will never know the joy of being imperfect. I am so blessed to have lived long enough to have my hair turn gray and to have my youthful laughs be forever etched into deep grooves on my face. I have earned these character lines. I can say no or yes and mean it. As you get older, it's easier to be positive. You care less about what other people think. I don't question myself anymore and I even earned the right to be wrong. I like being old. You set me free. I like the person I have become. I'm not going to live forever, but while I am still here, I will not waste time lamenting what could have been or worrying about what will be. For the first time in my life, I don't have to have a reason to do the things I want to do. If I want to eat a dessert first, lie on the couch, watch an old movie or sports shows for hours or skip that meeting, I have earned that right. I have put in my time doing, so now I can be a bit selfish without feeling guilty. This woman surely has found joy in her aging. Remember, the pursuit of happiness is the chase of a lifetime. May your life be filled with many such moments. In Judaism, age is defined in the ethics of our fathers as 40, one maintains understanding. At 50, you can offer counsel. At 60, one attains seniority. Judaism values age because it means a person has had more time to garner wisdom and life experiences. Judaism obliges us to honor the aged. Age counts for a lot more than making the path, just marking the passage of time. From a Jewish perspective, aging is a source of pride, something worthy of honor. Wine is a universal Jewish way to mark the passage of time. At a Brit, a wedding canopy, Shabbat, or holiday meal. Wine, like people, improves with age. We are judged when we leave this world at who we are when we finish our journey, not who we were when we were most attractive, most energetic, or displayed our most potential. Jews are people of the spirit and the mind, realms that are truly ageless. The body is just a vehicle to house them. As my mother would say, I wish all of you to live to be a Hendrik and Svansik. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. There were many words of wisdom in what you said. And I recognized uh, myself and other people in many of the things you said. And I will add one thing that I found is a benefit of aging, that my vocabulary keeps growing. You know, you don't forget the words, you know, you learned when you were younger and you keep learning new words your whole life, especially if you're a reader. So I, I enjoyed that. And, um, and thank you. And I want to see if anyone has a question. If not, I have a question. Anyone who has a, a comment or question for Renee is welcome to put it in the chat box. And while you're thinking, I'll make one of my own observations that um, as you get, you know, we know it, we all know people who at various decades along the path who become very nostalgic for their youth and endlessly tell stories about themselves uh, in their youth and their prime and they repeat those stories. Um, is that a healthy thing that we should encourage or something we should try to suppress? I think it's important to let people be people and what they are. I think the problem is, it's like, you know, when you're with somebody who complains a lot, you really don't wanna hear that. It becomes that same thing too. So that for your own survival, it might be better to kind of switch the conversation a little bit. But many times people do live in the past. Um, it, depending on your relationship with the person, you might want to point out something that happened more recently that maybe you think might have brought that person some joy 
that they are less observant of. Sometimes we get fixated and it's hard to unfixate. I'm not sure that's a word, but it's hard to, to change people from who they are because we become more of who we are when we began our journey. And so I think you need to be empathetic and sympathetic. And if you can change the conversation every now and then for both of your benefits, that would be fine. Okay, thank you. I'm going to read one comment from Susan Steinberg. Uh, she said that your remarks were beautiful, you made many positive points regarding aging. Okay, thank you, Susan. I, um, you want to look at the Rx for, for doctor's visits? You want to put that on the screen? Yeah, that's... I think many times when we go to the doctors, um, it can be an overwhelming experience because it's a finite amount of time. And we don't always know what that finite amount of time is going to be. And the doctor has an agenda. He or she is going to examine this, that, and the other, ask you those whatever questions, and move on. So this is a, many times people, I always carry, I'll show you what I do. I always carry with me a list of all of my medications, all of my doctors, all of my contact people, so that whenever um, I go to a doctor's office, whether new or old, because they always ask you, is our, is our list up to date? I want to say, how could it change? You're the one that's been just prescribing it, but I am, you know, I try to be a little respectful. So I show the list. So that gets that out of the way. Although some doctors actually ask you to take all your medicine bottles and stick them in a bag and bring them to the office because on those types of experiences, doctors can find out sometimes that you are using medications that are expired or that you should not necessarily continue to use. So it's for your benefit to do that. I also make a list of all the issues I want to discuss with the doctor. So my doctor is now very well trained because when I walk into the appointment and he asks me whatever he asks, he then says, oh, and, and what would you like to ask? Because I have that whole list. And I also know beforehand how long that appointment is going to be so that um, I know how much time I have. If in fact you go to the doctor and the doctor does not give you the time you want, then make sure you make a follow-up appointment quickly afterwards to be able to deal with those types of issues. You need to be in charge um, in that doctor's office because the doctor might be educated about certain things more than you or I, but he or she works for you. Uh, I remember going with my mom to a doctor and he seemed to be clueless. My mother had been going there for, I'm sure, you know, at least a hundred plus years. Uh, he should have known her, he should have known all those things. And so I kind of said something. My mom was from the old school. And after we left, she told me I was very disrespectful to the doctor. Uh, you know what? It's okay to be disrespectful to the doctor you're there to take care of you. And if the doctor says, you describe something and the doctor says, that's because you're old, that's why you're feeling that, I suggest that you leave that office and you find a doctor who deals with older people, such as a geriatrician who is educated to um, deal with older people and doesn't dismiss the types of things um, that other, other doctors have been listening to for years and kind of dismiss it. So you want to make that appointment uh, with the doctor, to, whether you're going yourself, whether you're going with a, a relative or a friend, these, you need to take charge of that visit. And so this sheet kind of explains some of those things of what you can do. If you have any questions about it, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Renee, do you, um, just want to see if I have anyone has a question. Moment. Um, 
Okay, there's a question about um, somebody, somebody in the house who is aging more rapidly than anticipated and seems to prefer being very inactive all of a sudden. Um, would you like to um, comment on that? What advice do you have for someone whose spouse is aging at a different pace and is kind of not taking a positive attitude towards it? First of all, I would talk to the doctor to get a doctor's input. Um, we all age at different paces and there are different times in our lives when different things affect us. <clears throat> Let's assume we've been having minor accidents with our car and somebody has suggested that we no longer drive and they take away the keys. Um, the person who now no longer has the freedom, I can assure you will not be a happy camper to be living with. Um, when I was young, I was newly married. My husband and I had one car and we shared it. So he would take it to work two days. I would have it three, whatever. I didn't have any place to go, but I know that the days that he had the car, I was definitely not a happy person. The idea that I didn't have that freedom was difficult. Um, but if somebody, you know, is aging and acting this way, it's possible that that person might go to speak to a psychologist, uh, go to a support group, maybe go to an adult day program. There are, you know, depending on the living situation, the person used to, uh, <coughs> let's say, play cards or play golf and is no longer doing it. Maybe there's something actually going on and I would speak to the doctor about it. And if that's not the case, you know, it's true. There are days that I know you and I probably get up in the morning and say, my God, you know, I was so busy yesterday. Maybe not so much during COVID, but I was so busy yesterday. I really don't think I want to do all the errands I'm going to do today. Um, and you know what? That's okay. The problem is when it, those days go on and on and on and you want to go and go, and your spouse does not want to, um, it is challenging. And it's, you know, in talking to a professional about it, whether it be, you know, a physician, a, you know, a psychologist, a geriatric care manager, um, that might be helpful. It, it's nice to get an, another person's view on the subject. Um, can you explain, Renee, this is my question. Um, if someone feels the uh, family member need, could benefit from a geriatric care manager or gerontologist, or I don't know what the different- Gerontologist is different. A gerontologist is somebody who studies aging. Yeah. A geriatric care manager or social work, is that a person sometimes who's a social worker? Many, a... many are yeah. social workers too, but they don't necessarily okay. practice as social workers. Um, some nurses go into that field too. Yes, yes. But so um, does this, is this cost, who it pays the cost of those services usually? And a geriatric care manager is out of your pocket. And what the manager does is actually evaluates, meets with the family, evaluates the situation um, and develops a care plan for the individual, for the family, for whatever. Um, it's a hefty fee for that first visit. And then thereafter it's an hourly fee. So let's assume it's determined that somebody needs home health aides. Um, whether you should hire privately or whether you should hire through an agency. There are advantages of both. Privately is perhaps less expensive. An agency, if somebody doesn't show up, an agency is able to fill in for that much better than if you have somebody privately. Um, then you develop whatever that care plan is. Uh, maybe it's going to an adult day program. Maybe someone is in the early stages of dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, maybe they you know, maybe they have Parkinson's. I mean, there are lots of issues that have different ramifications. And you know, moving to a nursing home is not necessarily the first place that one would suggest. It depends on the situation 
and the needs. Yeah, when we were chatting, uh, Renee, you mentioned a case of someone, a family who came to you after the person was already in a nursing home. And you said to me, I wish they had come to me before they made the decision. It was, oh, yes. That conversation, yes. that, that yes. was the mistake. Yes. In the end, you can save money and help somebody live a better quality life if you get have that consultation early and not wait till you have an emergency. Is that correct? Correct. I mean, that the situation that I shared with you, um, in the background, my dog is barking. I'm sorry to tell you. I gave him a treat and he's been quiet. I don't know what's going on. Um, but in the situation was a woman whose husband has had dementia for about four or five years, very quiet guy. Um, and she made the decision to put him in a facility during COVID. When you have to pause to take care of him a sec, we'll wait. <laughs> I'm gonna see if, I'll be right back. Understood. <laughs> Sometimes needs attention. Come here. Uh, so, you know, I, I recognize myself in some of the things Renee said, and, and the fact it really made an impression that, that volunteering helps you be a happier person as you age. And, you know, I must say, if it wasn't for my many roles as a volunteer, Women's League and, and beyond, this COVID thing and this isolation would have been depressing. But by keeping myself so busy and connected to people through my work, even if it's at in front of a computer, it's it's um, it definitely has its benefits. I think that people who are busier tend to be happier. Um, sometimes it's challenging, sometimes it's not. And, but each person has to find their level. You, you can't, Jasper's gonna be with, with us for the rest of the time. Uh, he is a really great consultant with aging people. He, he lives with me, so you can imagine. Um, and so he doesn't have the words to express it, but he believes in everything I say. So I'm very lucky. As those of you who live with husbands or, or spou other spouses, who don't always agree with you, I'm sorry. Jasper always agrees with me. So I have that advantage. Um, I must say, Renee, but, that somebody put in the chat box. Go ahead. Made the point that Jewish Family Services, the agency, has geriatric care manager services on a sliding scale based on people's income that are funded through philanthropy. So those services are sometimes available at a lower fee. Lighting scale. Yeah, those are service. those are true, but you know, there's also the fact. I mean, like here in San Antonio, um, they have a. It was any no one's on there from San Antonio, correct? Okay, Th their quality of geriatric care management is not that great in Boston. Their quality of <coughs> and the in the uh, services come here are, is really good. So yes, some of it is slotting scale, but you know what? You get what you pay for sometimes. And it's not that you're with them a long period of time, but you're able to put a perspective on things. And so instead of somebody spending their time searching and, and trying to figure out what to do, which sometimes costs them more money and more aggravation and more time, Spending that amount of money for the services is well worth it. Okay. Someone um, would like you. Uh, I don't know the services in Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, when I moved to, to Texas, um, I had to make a decision uh, whether I wanted to make a living or make a life. And I felt that it, my husband retired at that point. He was a, in, an attorney. I felt it was important I had to make a life. So I know less about the quality of care, you know, geriatric services in the state of Texas than I do in Massachusetts. Okay, someone uh, would like you to elaborate further on this, how to make the, the process of making this decision, whether it's time for assisted living or a nursing home for a loved one. Um, what is the, is there a tipping point? I mean, what goes into that decision 
that um, if a family does not have a geriatric care manager, what are some of the things they should weigh? I know that's a very broad question. Do you have any? It's challenging because you're dealing with individual personalities. So the, the, the person who you're considering moving out of their environment, once you move somebody out of an environment that is familiar to them, that is comforting, um, you're already um, upsetting the apple cart. So depending on the person's needs, uh, you're, if you are seeing a geriatrician as your medical doctor, they certainly can give you some input as to what they think um, the level of cares uh, that that person might need. You also, if, if it is a spouse that you're living or a, or a parent that you are living with on a regular basis, you are responsible for, you also have to take into consideration who you are as a person, what abilities you have and what you can live with. There are people, you know, this leads into my next piece, but there are people um, who, somebody came to me, a man who had a, his mother lived out of state and there was really not, no relatives there. He lived in Massachusetts. And his mom moved, was in an assisted living and he was very happy with the assisted living there and she was thriving there. Um, so he came and he visited her twice a year. And he was thinking, should he bring her to Massachusetts or should he leave her there? And I asked him if she came to Massachusetts, how frequently you would be visiting her in her, wherever you put her in Massachusetts. Oh, maybe every six, eight weeks. I thought to myself, that doesn't seem like it's a great advantage when you're happy with where she is, where she's happy, where she's stable. Perhaps you could consider visiting her instead of twice a year, four times a year. And during that time in Massachusetts, look for assisted living or nursing homes, depending on what her level would be, that you would feel would be the right fit for her in Massachusetts. And that's what he ended up doing. So again, it's an individual thing. I, there are people who, who take care of parents in their homes and they have children that are there too. And one woman, she was stretched so thin, um, she ended up in the hospital. Her teenage children ended up taking care of her mother. And when she came out of the hospital, she realized that she could not do this anymore. So it was like a crisis situation and she had to place her mother elsewhere. Um, there's not a one size fits all. It's all, you know, a very slippery slope. And, but most people don't wake up in the morning from having a vital day to wake up in the next morning and be unbelievably needy. There are signs that you see, whether it's somebody with whom you live or somebody that, you know, a parent, an aunt, an uncle that you see on a fairly regular basis. Um, you might not, you might be denying that you see those signs, but those signs are there. Uh, people try to keep, you know, keep up a good upper lip, um, but you, if you walk around, you know, like where they live and you see that there's stacks of mail that hasn't been opened, you see bills that don't seem to have been paid, um, the, the house looks a little dirtier, the, the person is wearing stained clothes, uh, they're telltale signs. If they're having lots of accidents with the car, all kinds of things that give you those warnings that you know you need to act. But you need yeah, Renee, to with a relative of mine, one of the signs, and I think this must be common, you look in their refrigerator right. and you see there's spoiled food in there. And uh, some people, I had a, a aunt who you know, became a hoarder as she got older and couldn't stand, didn't want to throw away even a scrap of leftovers and they were, you know, that's a sign, there's something wrong. Yeah, there are, lo there are lots of signs, 
that, you know, we don't always see them. And that's why sometimes when you have a professional in, they can zero you in on some of those particular things. You know, there's not an easy solution. I used to have clients in a, um, a nursing home specialized in Alzheimer's. And some of those people were really appear to be quite catatonic. And they would bring in a piano player every six weeks, an older man as it was. And he used to pay those, you know, goodies and oldie tunes. People who I thought were completely out of it got, started singing. Uh, you know, whatever the tune was, I, I used to love to go with my client that was there to, to those things because it made me feel so good to see this. And one of them had a, a spouse. It was a woman. Her husband was living in the community. He would come there and he would take her to the dance floor. Now, she was... As I said to you, she was, she appeared to me like she was like completely out of it. On the dance floor, she was out there dancing like a spring chicken. I mean, it was like, it was amazing. Um, they have found that people, you know, with dementia going to the museum or music. I mean, there are lots of things that are helpful, but it, again, it's not an easy thing. And because you know, we don't necessarily live in the next community with somebody. Um, we don't always see it. My mom, I'll give you this one example. My mom lived with, lived in an apartment, uh, in a condominium, I don't know, 10 miles away from me. And she, she had a stroke and she was doing so-so. Uh, she was in her eighties, mid to late eighties. And when she would call me when she didn't feel well, it would like, you know, it was like, it made me feel uncomfortable. And so my husband suggested that maybe we ask our my mom to live with us. Wasn't my suggestion, it was his. And we discussed it with the children. I have, I have four children, two were, uh, one had graduated from college, one was at college, two were at home. The youngest was uh, 12. And um, they all agreed it was a great idea. And we built onto our home on the first floor. We built a bedroom, a little living room. Uh, we made the bathroom handicap accessible and she moved in. We discussed it with her, she thought, whatever, she moved in. And um, my mom kvetched. She would say to me, oh, you take care of the dog better than you take care of me. She, I wanted to make her feel comfortable, so I wanted to involve her. So I gave her some uh, dress to hem or to sew. She was a great sewer. How would you exist if I wasn't here? Who would do this? I said, well, you know, I, it would be very hard for me, mom. But I also had her do, uh, she used to make split pea soup with canadals for Friday night dinner. And I Eventually I had an aide in to help her. So she directed that person doing it. I tried to give her meaning in her life. And eventually it took me at least six months to figure there was something wrong in the fact that my husband and I and my four children were all involved in my mother's care. My brother and sister and nieces and nephews were just pop in and any which way they wanted. So I had a family meeting and I assigned weekends for everybody. They were responsible to make her happy and be with her. And she lived with us for three and a half years. Eventually I had AIDS, you know, during the day and then weekend and then 24 seven and what have you, it was a whole progression. I rarely recommend that to my, to, I, to my clients. It's a big chunk of, you know, responsibility and family sacrifice. If it were to, if I were to ask to do it again, I would probably do it. It's not always the ideal situation, but not not every, you know not everyone wears the same dress or the same shoes or what have you what fits you and what works for you in that situation is the way you need to go right and every family has different number of siblings who pop in and help and different dynamics it's very variable um people are in the chat box making comments about their situation i see that <laughs> going to read everything. On or do you want me to do you want me to talk about the sandwich generation now or what? Uh, sure. And then okay. go ahead. All right. What about the sandwich generation? The people in the middle balancing the needs of aging parent, 
dependent child and self. As the caregiver of children and parents, local and long distance, they are pressured from all sides. They are at the center of a circle made up of characters and events that make up our life each of which exerts a field of energy which simultaneously pushes and pulls at our being. Even though we may be part of the same group, each situation is unique. There is no simple solution. No one size fits all. Each case must be dealt with individually. So how do you cope? What can you do? Will, will, you, will there be time for you? There is a generation who thought you could have it all, family, career, self-fulfillment. However, the world in which we live has changed. Family life, work, and, and aging. You're caught in the middle trying to adjust, cope, and juggle all the effects of these changes, while also struggling with the emotional, psychological, and physical realities of your own midlife. We live in a mobile society, family members long distance from each other. Men and women wait until they're older to begin families, Financial constraints require two incomes and families come in different shapes and sizes, single parent, divorce, blended, single sex and traditional, and people are living longer. About 80% of all care of older individuals is still provided by families, not Medicare, Medicaid or social service agencies. Today, more than ever before, adult children provide more extensive care to children, to parents, for a much longer period of time. And it is these adult children um, and their parents who navigate the maze of elder care options and services while trying to cope with their own aging. As parents age, they no longer resemble grandparents of old. They retire earlier, are more physically active and engage in diverse pastimes. Some live nearby, others at a distance. Their traditional weekly Shabbat dinner is replaced by phone calls, emails, Zoom, or not so regular visits. You don't always notice the subtle changes. Your parents don't share the losses they experience and the concerns they might have. Then something happens, you need to act. What do you do? How do you decide? Can your parent continue living alone? Or if so, what resources might make that possible? Should he or she stay or move closer to where you live or even live with you? or move into a senior care community, assisted living, a nursing home. Do you decide or do you talk it over with your parents? How can you initiate such a discussion? What if siblings and parents disagree? How do you locate and then evaluate living arrangements? How will finances impact these decisions? What about legal and health considerations, healthcare proxies? Decisions about what to do when faced with life-threatening medical issues. Burial arrangements. Where do you find elder law attorneys who can assist with estate and Medicaid planning? What about doctors who specialize in geriatrics and don't dismiss a complaint by saying, that's what happens when you get old? Is this dementia, Alzheimer's, or depression? Do we need and can we get long-term care insurance? Are there public resources, senior centers, adult daycare, home care services? Can you get the car keys away from your mom or dad? What do you say when the hospital discharge planner says your parent must leave the hospital tomorrow and you, you do not want him or her going to a place an hour away? Such questions bombard the sandwich generation and their parents. There is no right answer, no solution that will fill all situations. But there are resources available to assist you to make the best decision for today, which most likely will have to be reevaluated for tomorrow. In, um, as a former geriatric care manager and longtime facilitator of a support group for adult children of relatives and aging parents, I share with the caregivers the following strategies that can work in all cases. Communicate well and listen actively to your entire family, young and old, before the crisis. When dialoguing with your parents, beware of their weaknesses, but rely on their strengths and expertise. With your siblings and your children, talk to them about the needs, ask for their support, cooperation, involvement, share and delegate, 
Do not be afraid to ask for help. This can be hard because it may mean giving up control or appearing less than perfect. But it is vital because you cannot fix it, nor can you do it all. Pre-plan so that when the crisis hits, you have already done your homework. Identified resources, options, wants, needs, limitations. This empowers you to make informed and less emotional decisions. An equally important concept of self-care, making time for yourself. If you do not take care of yourself, you will be in no shape to care for others. The role of caregiver is a complex one. The feelings associated with caregiving are wide ranging and conflicting and may be impacted by old unresolved family rivalries. The truth is that our personalities do not change because we have grown older. Instead, these traits may appear more pronounced. Be prepared to experience times of anger, resentment, shame, shock, denial, sadness, emptiness, and fear. These all come with the territory, but are temporary. During these moments, make time to share and talk. Find a support group, a professional, a caring friend, and look for the laughs and joy that life does bring. Develop your own stress busters and eliminate from your vocabulary, I should, I have to, replace them with I need, I want. This evening, I could not present individual solutions because each situation carries with it its own remedy. I instead raised issues and asked questions. You've probably asked these and many more. To develop answers to your unique challenges, you can co connect with professionals can assist you with problem solving, identifying and evaluating options, and developing realistic expectations. You can balance the need of aging parent, dependent child, and self when you're able to say, my needs matter. I am good enough. From my own experience as a caregiver and from the experience of the people of my support groups, I know that none of us is prepared for the role of caregiver. There is no such thing as a perfect caregiver and no one right way. The role is a difficult one. All we can do is do our best. Asking questions to acquire knowledge is the tool to successfully navigate the maze into which you will venture. When you do this and after you acknowledge your own needs, you'll be able to carve out that time for yourself. Thank you. Covered so many, so great. Can you recommend any reading material? I mean, what if someone wants to dive deeper into some of these topics? Where, where can they go? Um, besides a geriatric uh, care manager for more information, they can. I'm sure there's a wealth of um, materials on the internet and uh, reading. Materials. I'm sure there is too. You know, as I said, I have not been doing this for some time. I did. I did facilitate a support group for adult children of, of aging parents here in San Antonio for a couple months when COVID began, mm -hmm. um, which was difficult because it's much better when you do it face to face as opposed to on Zoom because you develop a relationship and it becomes give and take so that actually the caregivers are teaching each other and sharing experiences. So when, when you go home, when my mom lived with us, I, I was a member of such a group and found out that many times the things, the techniques I develop, other people liked. So techniques that somebody else developed, I, I liked. So we learned from each other. So it was a great type of thing. As far as reading things, I, and on top of my head, I have no idea at the moment, but I did have another handout, which talks about how you can deal with your own stress. Um, yeah, I, I want to ask um, whether we could share that. I'm going to ask um, our Karen or Razel, whoever's on the call from our office, that we can share the materials with those who've registered for this event. After you can email it to them because I think this helps you um, not only as a caregiver, <clears throat> but it helps you in dealing with stress in your life no matter what. And, you know, we all have whether it be, you know, an aged parent or relative, a neighbor, um, even a young person who can be a pain in the butt. So some of those things can be helpful. You know, it's like set limits, say no. 
those are things you apply for your own survival and help you um, navigate situations that you deal with perhaps on a regular basis. And especially during COVID, I think most things that we're facing, some of them get a, um, they come to a higher pitch because of the, we're not out there being with people the way we used to. So that when you're having lunch with some friends and something is bothering you and you're not sure whether you should talk about it, sometimes you're able to put it out there. Um, I have pamph pamphlets. You know, and Renee, somebody, I see, um, let me tell you a couple of things I'm reading in the chat. Okay. Someone wrote that AARP has some wonderful, a wonderful manual on caregiving. Okay. And also the National Caregiver Association has resort materials. And if you have, um, you know, a JCC near you, some of them have support groups for people taking caregivers. There, there, there are many resources out there. AARP, I didn't think of that. That's true. Um, and it depends on where you live. You know, ask your rabbi. Uh, they would know too. And, and it would be uh, nice at synagogues to have those types of support groups. My synagogue in Massachusetts has a support group for people who's who've lost, have somebody who's died in their family. But I know right. another group that does have a, a group for people who are dealing with, they have something called a memory cafe, which is um, an opportunity for people who have Alzheimer's to kind of get together in a supervised environment, but their caregivers also get together so that they can exchange ideas. They can let it all out. Um, they can socialize. Because many times, if you are married to someone who has Alzheimer's, <coughs> the couples that you used to go out socialize with are as, aren't as eager to go out with you the way they used to. So right. this is a, a thing that I know it's in Massachusetts. I know it's in different uh, states. I don't know exactly where at this point, but these memory cafes have been a, a lifesaver for a lot of people. Now we're getting close to the end of our time. I want to also mention that in the chat box, people had other, I'm sorry, I didn't get to everything, but um, I think there it's preserved in the recording. And <laughs> even Renee, you could look and All right. reach out maybe. I, I thank you for asking me to do this. A lot of compliments in the chat box too. For thank, this. You. And thank you so much. I loved being a care manager and uh, you know, it was hard to give it up. But as I said, the experience I had at Women's Leave gave me the confidence to start my own business. And so I'm always appreciative of Women's League for that. Thank you. And in the chat box, a lot of people are giving recommendations. So please Good. read what applies to you in your area. So in closing, I just want to thank you very much, Renee, for sharing your experience with us. We uh, can all benefit from many a lot of what you said, it applies every, touches each one of us in our lives in one way or another. Um, so we want to thank your dog, Jasper, I think his, his name yes. is, after initially saying hello to us. And thank you um, to um, everyone who has joined us today. Uh, we appreciate your participation and everyone who asked very good questions. Uh, Debbie and Rabbi, uh, Wallace Fields, and uh, thank you for your earlier comments. I just want to mention that um, our next personal conversation is slated for March 18th. The working topic that I'm fleshing out is going to be about organ donation. And that is, a, we're going to look at that for the standpoint of both living donors and other kinds of transplants, and not just the medical aspects. Uh, that is, it's more, I, it's going to be a multi-pronged approach looking at the societal obstacles, um, the psychological considerations for donor recipient, the ethical considerations, and of course, rabbinical teachings and halakha standards uh, within the cons conservative Judaism. So stay tuned for more information and you may reach out to me personally if you know someone who has been touched by this or has expertise in this. I already have a few names. My email address is the Lieber, L E B as in boy, E R at WLCJ.org. So um, I thank you again for um, 
participating and thank you, Renee. I hope we'll meet with you again. Thank you. And everyone, um, let me say good night and um, best wishes to you all.